welcome everybody, all of our Serbian friends. So now Darren Miller, club member and president of JM Construction will introduce our program. Thank you, Steve. Our guest today is Joe Serencioni. He's the president of Plowshares Fund, which is a global security foundation. He's also host of Press the Button, a weekly podcast from Plowshares Fund dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. Personally, I would encourage each of you to check out the podcast. I uh, look forward every Tuesday to being uh, absolutely terrified and hopeful all on the same, same day. Um, Serencioni is also the author of several books, including Nuclear Nightmares, Securing the World Before It's Too Late, Bomb Scare, The History and Future of Nuclear Weapons, and Deadly Arsenals, Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical Threats. He has worked on nuclear weapons policy in Washington for over 35 years and is considered one of the top experts in the field. He served previously as Vice President for the National Security at the Center for American Progress, Director for Nonproliferation at the Carnegie Endowment, and Senior Associate at Stimson. He worked for nine years as a professional staff of the U.S. House of Representatives Committees on Armed Services and Government Operations. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a mem former member of the International Security Advisory Board for Secretaries of State John Kerry and Hillary Clinton. He also teaches at the Georgetown University Graduate School of Foreign Service. Serencioni's commentary has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, MSNBC, CNN, the Boston Globe, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Financial Times, Kyoto News, Moscow Times, Foreign Policy, The Hill, Daily Beast, and Huffington Post. It's my great pleasure to welcome Joe Serencioni. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for, for, for having me back here. I think this is my third talk at the Rotary Club. And I want to particularly thank Annette and your mother, Joan Robinson, for encouraging me to come and for al allowing me to, to come to Milwaukee on this trip again. And I want to thank the students from White Fish Bay High School, where I spent a, a, a grueling morning <laughs> answering their questions. I don't know. I kind of remember high school as being easy. I don't know what I was thinking. These kids were tough. They were smart. They raked me over the coals for about an hour and a half. It was great. Thank you very much. And they're doing a documentary that they're, that they're um, submitting to a C-SPAN contest. And the authors of that, uh, the, the producers of that documentary are here today. Would you welcome these high school students to your Rotary Club? Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, it, it has been my habit to sort of congratulate you on your various sports accomplishments, when your basketball team is playing well, when the Packers are doing well. But there's a ball game tonight. And I'm from Washington, D.C. <laughs> so congratulations on a great season. <laughs> you, you, you've had a wonderful run. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. I'll be glued to the television, as I'm sure most of you will be. And on a, uh, a slightly more serious note, I just wanted to thank you personally for your commitment to eradicating polio. Many people think this disease is behind us. It is not. I have a personal connection to this disease. The man who gave me my first uh, job in the US government was uh, Congressman Charles Bennett, a conservative Democrat from Jacksonville, Florida. He was a World War II vet. He emerged from behind enemy lines in the Philippines with a very debilitating case of polio. His legs were paralyzed for the rest of his life. He was told he would never walk again with uh, will, and determination, and a pair of crutches and braces. He not only walked, he ran for office, he was elected in 1948, the same class as John F. Kennedy, and he never looked back. He served Jacksonville proudly until the year uh, he retired. He got me started in government, um, and he knew the seriousness of this disease, and I thank you very much for your dedication in seeing to it that polio once and for all is eradicated from the face of the earth. Thank you. Um, well, I want to give a look forward to, for you to understand what's about to unfold in the presidential campaigns and how national security issues will play out in that. 
This uh, forecast has come has become significantly more difficult to make in just the last seven days with the um, the emergement emergence of the impeachment momentum in the House of Representatives that just uh, took off uh, after the revelations of the, the Ukraine call. This is a highly volatile, dynamic, fluid factor. It's very difficult for us to calculate how this is going to play out. Um, but you can already see how this might raise several risks. So if you don't mind, I'm going to talk about some of the risks, we national security risks we face from impeachment, and then some of the prospects for what the elections might hold for US national security policy, particularly when it comes to the issues of, um, of overseas wars and nuclear policy. So let's start off with the, with the risks. Uh, a number, I saw a few people have opined about the risks of impeaching the sitting president, how that will weaken the United States and, and make this, our stewardship of national security and foreign policy less certain. I think that's true. I think there is a real risk there, and it's one that the, the represent Democratic and Republican representatives in the House are weighing very seriously. But there are also other risks associated with impeachment, and that have to deal more with the behavior of the president of the United States. What does a president beset with domestic political battles do? Well, it's quite possible that this will increase the incentive for a president to engage in a foreign domestic conflict in order to rally the base, rally the nation around the flag and uh, see if he can put an end to some of the, or at least suspend the domestic political problems. Richard Nixon tried a gambit like this when he was under the impeachment threat. Some of you may, re may remember he talked, manufactured really, a crisis in the Middle East that he was, was said was severe enough that he raised the nuclear alert level of the country to DEFCON 3. That meant that our bombers and missiles were put on a higher rate of alert, ready to launch um, in, a, in a very short amount of time. It's possible that President Trump will, will, will decide that those advisors that are encouraging to take military action against Iran should be listened to this time. Remember, he was 10 minutes away from launching the, the missiles and planes when he decided to pull the plug on that operation. It's possible that he may decide that this is in his interest to do it this time. And we could see a conflict that already has supporters in this country. There's a group of people in this country, in the region, that want to have a military conflict with Iran. Donald Trump has been the barrier to that. He has not wanted a war. He has calculated correctly, as Tucker Carlson has warned him, that if he starts a war with Iran, it will tank the global economy and cost him the election. I think that's an accurate calculation. I think that's right. But his situation might become so desperate that he wants to at least get to the point where he can run for re-election. And he might, might be tempted by that kind of foreign military intervention. The second risk that this presents is the use of nuclear weapons. The President of the United States has unfettered sole authority to launch nuclear weapons whenever he wants for whatever reason he wants. This system never made sense, but it seemed to make more sense when we we're in the Cold War and we were worried about a Russian nuclear attack. The idea that thousands of nuclear weapons could come streaming over the pole without warning. In that situation, our satellites would pick them up, we'd be warned of them, there would be a military authority alert, the military authorities would, would, as they have in the past under false alerts, would contact the National Security Advisor or the Secretary of Defense who would in turn wake up the President, and the President would have at most seven minutes of consultation on the phone before he had to decide, and it's always been a he, had to decide whether to press the button and launch the weapons, and to launch the weapons before they could be destroyed. That's the scenario most people are familiar with, but that's when the military wakes up the president. It can go in reverse. Because of that situation, the president has sole authority. He doesn't require consultation of anybody in order to order a nuclear strike. He doesn't need the consultation of the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of State or his national security advisor. He doesn't need to call a cabinet meeting. He doesn't need any of that. As Richard Nixon said, again, during that impeachment battle, I can walk into my office pick up the phone, and in 30 minutes, 70 million people would be dead. That was true. That was correct. The president can do that, and you can't stop him. 
as long as the order was legal, and if the president was choosing from one of the many pre-vetted options that are available to him, that is, in the briefcase carried by a military officer who is required to be within a minute of the president at all times, the military can't refuse the order. We are a civilian-controlled country. We have civilian control over the military. It would be mutiny to refuse that order. And if somebody did, they would be removed from office and another general would be put in place when he would carry out that order. The whole system is designed for rapidity and certainty and, 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 and sureness of execution. There is no debate in this order of, of launching of command and control of nuclear weapons. I don't think that's likely. I'm sorry if I'm scaring you again. We talked about this on the podcast. I don't think that's likely, but the ability is there, and we should be aware of it. The, um, the third risk is, is, that, is that while the, the country is engaged in this struggle, some would say distracted, others would say focused on this struggle, there's a possibility that our adversaries will take advantage of us, that there might be countries who would commit acts of aggression that the U.S might block. You already see this in action. Uh, uh, India's President Modi has undertaken an unprecedented occupation of Kashmir, a disputed region. It's a Kashmir is still in lockdown. It's been over a month now since they've been sort of cut off from the outside world with little U.S. response. Uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu of, of Israel is threatening to annex parts of the West Bank. A president that's in the United States that's distracted would have less, might have less will to resist such moves. You could see leaders taking such moves in the future. Or, kind of the reverse, you might see more leaders offering dirt on domestic political opponents to the president of the United States in return for favors. Knowing that this was a president that was open for business on this front, you might see more kinds of deals being made to the detriment of US national security. That's just some of the scenarios that we have to watch, we have to be aware of, we have to try and prevent as, as much as possible while we engage in, the, in this domestic democratic exercise. If we get through this period, if the impeachment runs its course one way or the other and the republic survives intact in and we do not have a civil war, um, we were going to have a presidential election in, in just a little over a year. Um, it, if the Democrats win that election, the leading Democratic candidates right now, Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, have all pledged to remake U.S. nuclear policy, U.S. national security. All of them, one place or another, are in favor of ending the endless wars, of accelerating the the withdrawal of U.S. forces from the Middle East, and all of them are in favor of restoring some rationality to our nuclear weapons budgets, which are now on track to spend almost $2 trillion over the next 25 years for an entire new generation of nuclear weapons, and to re-engage in measures to reduce nuclear weapons. The reduction process has ended. None of the nine nuclear weapon states in the world today are reducing their arsenals. Most of them are actually making new weapons, some growing their arsenals. Just yesterday, the Chinese demonstrated a brand new, rather terrifying nuclear missile, long range missile that could carry 10 warheads plus penetration aids, getting it through any known or conceivable US missile defenses. So there are real risks out there. There are real problems that need to be solved. I think if you see the, the um, the Democrats come to power, they're going to, going, to, they're going to tackle that. During this crisis, however, there are also some, op some, uh, some reason to be optimistic about some things that Donald Trump could do. I've told you about the terrifying things he might do. There are also some positive things he could do. The President of the United States wants to make a deal. He wants to make a deal with North Korea. He wants to make a deal with Iran. Just in the last 24 hours, We've had two stories that shed some light on this. There's a story now in, in uh, Politico talking, uh, the, the, the inside the Beltway journal that tracks all things politics, that uh, reports that President Rouhani of Iran had worked out with President Macron of France a four-part agreement with the United States in order to get 
get both Iran and the United States back in compliance with the Iran nuclear deal and to start new negotiations for a new, better deal, something that President Trump has promised since the campaign, but so far has not delivered. It turns out there is, in fact, interest on both sides in engaging. It didn't work. It fell short. Apparently, the Iranians at the last minute decided not to engage for their own domestic political reasons, but there's something there. So it is possible that Donald Trump might make a deal with Iran, and this, of course, would have tremendous political benefits for him. And the other is with North Korea. Just today, it was announced that we're going to restart working level talks with the North Koreans, something we haven't had for months. And it's the kind of talks that are absolutely essential if there's going to be any kind of an agreement. And there's interest in both the US side and the North Korean side in yet another photo op summit. This time, that photo op summit might be able to produce a deal that would freeze and maybe roll back the North Korean program. In other words, a deal with North Korea that would look a lot like the Iran deal the president has rejected, but is really the only sensible way to go. So you have these kinds of possibilities out there. And here comes a political problem. The political problem is the Democrats and their response to things like this. And unfortunately, too many Democrats are tempted to try to get to the right of President Trump and attack him from the right. Ever since John F. Kennedy attacked Eisenhower for the missile gap in the 1960 uh, election, Democrats have been trying to get to the right of political opponents, but there are no John F. Kennedys. It's very hard for Dems to do that in this current environment, but they keep trying. So yesterday in Washington, John Bolton, the, the former national security advisor who was either fired or quit, depending on who you listen to, you're fired, I quit. He appeared for the first time on a Washington stage and criticized the president on North Korea. John Bolton is a hawk. He would rather, he, he actually thinks military action is what we need for, against North Korea. And he's critical of Donald Trump's actions, actions to try to negotiate a deal, calls them naive and poorly thought out. Well, some of the Democrats jumped right on that. And because there was a criticism of Trump, they jumped right on that in the process, undermining diplomacy, sort of discrediting the very notion of talking with North Korea in order to score some political points. So it's not, so this, this partisan politics is, is unfortunately increasing, 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 making it extremely difficult for any of these more optimistic scenarios to play out, even if it was possible for the administration to actually negotiate any of the deals with North Korea or, or Iran. It's not clear to me that they've got a competent team that can actually do this. It's like the Detroit Tigers suddenly showing up in the World Series. It's nice to be there, but they can't really play. It's just not gonna happen. And you might have that situation with the national security team, which has been in turmoil pretty much from the beginning of the administration, very from when the first national security advisor had to resign within uh, four weeks of being appointed. The the, the, there's been in turmoil. I, I think most of us have trouble remembering the name of the Secretary of Defense now. Who's our representative to the United Nations? Do we have a Homeland Security Secretary? Do we have undersecretaries of state in charge of these critical areas? The team's in turmoil. It's, 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 it's not a good look. Um, I just got two more points I want to make before I, I stop and open up for some, some questions so I can answer more directly what you're thinking about. Um, the other is, a, is a, a bold prediction that no matter what happens with the impeachment or what happens with the elections, you're probably going to see the next president of the United States decrease the U.S. military budget. It's just reached unaffordable levels. It's at $738 billion later this month we will get a conference report. It's called the National Def Defense Authorization Act. It's in conference right now between the House and the Senate. It will come out, but we already know what the number is, $738 billion. It's uh, almost $200 uh, billion more than it was during most of the Obama administration. It far exceeds the levels we were spending even during the Cold War. It exceeds the levels we were spending during the Korean War, uh, during the Vietnam War. Um, it, and it is, it, is, it is unaffordable. Whether you're a Republican who's concerned about the deficit 
you're going to have to cut this, or a Democrat who wants to propose a Green New Deal. You're going to need that money, either to reduce deficit spending or to put into the domestic programs. So I think no matter what politicians are saying now, you're probably going to see that kind of cut. And there's one more thing uh, uh, where I think there's actually some sort of, that's an unspoken bipartisan fact of life. A more articulated one is I think we are going to continue to wind down what some people call the endless wars. And on that defense authorization bill is a, a, a demonstration of the bipartisan unity that has grown in this country over that. The American public clearly wants to end these wars. And you've seen a sharp war dr uh, drawdown over the past few years. And on the defense authorization bill is a bipartisan amendment offered by Ro Khanna, Representative Ro Khanna from California, one of the most liberal members of the House, and Matt Gates of, uh, of uh, Connecticut, one of the most conservative members of the House. And the Khanna Gates Amendment garnered 251 votes on the floor of the House. So that means it got a lot of Republican votes. And it got 51 votes in the Senate in support. It didn't end up becoming attached to the bill there, but 51 senators indicated their support. And this is a bill that would require congressional authorization for any new war against Iran. It would prohibit funding for any military activities against Iran, not in response to an Iranian attack and not authorized by the Congress of the United States. So you're seeing this kind of bipartisan majority come together to restore the congressional ro role in making wars, in deciding when we go to war, a, a right enshrined in the Constitution, they're trying to get it back, and using the power of the purse to try to bring that amendment. Let me just read you just two sentences from a group, uh, a coalition of conservative groups called the Concerned Veterans for America, Freedom Works, and R Street, three conservative organizations who wrote to the members in support of this. They said it must not and constitutionally cannot be left to any one administration alone to decide these issues. Doing so too often results in endless wars and as President Trump strongly noted in this year's State of the Union address, great nations do not fight endless wars. So I think we're, we're seeing the, 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 the Congress, the American people struggle with this, try to bring these war to, to an end. Uh, I, I think you're going to see both a rationalization of the US military budget and a rationalization of our military footprint abroad. No matter who wins these elections, the momentum is just too strong at this point. It's unlikely to be stopped absent some surprise national development. And one final, final, final point, that whoever is elected president, I believe you're going to see that president return into more direct engagement with the United Nations. The United Nations is often a, an organization that is reviled by the far right and often too, too ignored by the far left. But it becomes central to either implementing the kinds of deals that Donald Trump wants to make, but North Korea and Iran, those have to go through the UN Security Council. That's how we make these deals stick. That's how we get the international cooperation you need to make these deals work. And it's going to be essential for the, for the Democrats. If they want to craft a new nuclear policy that relies on nuclear reductions and stronger uh, sanctions against states that are developing these nuclear weapons, again, you have to go to the UN Security Council. So this is an institution that is celebrating its 74th year uh, th this year. It was our invention. We did it. We created it. We've always seen this as a vital tool for preserving stability and international cooperation abroad. And it remains as, as vital as ever, even during these tumultuous times. That is the one ray of hope I have to offer you. And with that slight glimmer of sunshine, let me stop my talk and open up for any questions that you might have. Thank you very much for letting me address this. So we have a few minutes for questions. The gentleman on the right, and I will repeat your question for the benefit of the podcast you're doing and um, the audience. The question was, did the last North Korean test, I think it was their sixth, do so much damage to the test site that they really had to close the test site and come to the table? So was, was Kim just recognizing a reality rather than making a concession? The independent um, 
Examinations so, so far have indicated yes, there was damage to the test site. It was a very large test, about 125 kilotons. Um, but not so much that you couldn't have used the other tunnels in that test site for other nuclear weapons. And remember, it's just a mountain, it's just tunnels. You, you can go dig more. So it, it wasn't the, the lack of a test facility that caused Kim to end nuclear testing, number one, and to end the testing of long-range missiles. He had tested three times long-range missiles that can hit the United States. The intelligence assessment, my personal assessment, is that Kim Jong-un has a, a nuclear weapon that he can shrink to the size uh, of a warhead on a missile, and he has long-range missile, missiles that could probably hit the United States. Um, he's, he could hit us if, if he wanted to. Uh, he'd have some accuracy problems. Some of them might fail, but he has enough that he could do it. Um, in my estimation, Kim Jong-un wants something more than just a threat against the United States. He, wa he wants to deal with the United States. He wants to get out of the sanctions. He understands that the North Korean economy has to change, has to uh, modernize. And the United States has the keys to that lock. So he wants to make a deal. Would he eventually give up his nuclear weapons? I think we have to test that proposition. A lot of people have concluded no. I say we don't know the answer to that. But what we want to do is freeze the program. Remember, this freeze on nuclear testing and missile testing is voluntary. He's, he could reverse it. So you want to lock this in. You want to roll back the program. You want to shrink it. You want to start moving forward in a step-by-step -step manner. It would take, in my view, a good 10 years of engagement and step-by-steps to get to the point where we have to confront the question, will you give up those weapons? Will you now turn over your last weapons in exchange for A, B, and C? Thank you. Yes, sir. It, how close is Iran to being nuclear capable? Very far away. What they have is a very small civilian nuclear program at this point. The Iran anti-nuclear deal negotiated in 2014 shrank the program to a fraction of its previous size, froze it in place for a good 20 to 25 years, and put a, a, a cameras and, and locks on that program so that they couldn't cheat. So there was very little risk of any kind of nuclear surprise. They've been in compliance with that program, with that deal, until very recently when they've started to ratchet up some of their efforts to exceed some of the limits. But so far, those limits do not threaten a, a rapid breakout to a nuclear bomb. So to answer your question more concretely, if they decided right now, today, that they wanted to build a bomb, it would probably take them at least two years to build one or two devices, at least a year to reassemble the centrifuges, hook them all up, spin the uranium gas, and get enough material for one, for one bomb and then another year or so to bring everything back together and be able to construct the nuclear weapon and put it on a delivery mechanism. That, there's nearly an expert consensus on, on that. And of course, we would see them doing it. They couldn't undertake this kind of activity in secret. We would see them doing it, and we'd have a variety of options to stop that program. Yes, I'm going to go to this side of the room, then to the students. Yes, sir. You're at the head table. You must be important, whatever you want to ask. I'm happy, uh, the question is, what is China's grand strategy for the next few years and what should our Trump or our US response be to it? They're ratcheting up their aggression in the, in the region. They, there's reports that the Hong Kong police killed a demonstrator just yesterday with live bullets, the first time that's, that's happened. So I'll be happy to come back next year and give it a long <laughs> lecture on US-China policy. But in brief, China's policy ha is today what it has been for quite some time. They would like to have an extended period of, of quiet and stability on their border so they can complete their economic um, construction. They have come an enormous way. Some people believe that the greatest achievement of the 20, 20th century was China lifting 750 people out of poverty. It really is remarkable what they've done, but they're nowhere near where they want to be. And there's, it's rife with contradictions. There are many, many things that could rip China apart. And one of those is demands for democracy, like you're seeing from the demonstrators in Hong Kong, which is why the Chinese authorities are in such a dilemma over this. 
They do not want this kind of democracy. They do not want this kind of separation. They don't want Hong Kong to be pulling away from China because that might encourage other separatist movements. One of the internal contradictions in China is that although it's dominated, dominated by Han Chinese, I think that's about 93, 94% of the population, there are other ethnic majorities, uh, minorities that would like their independence. Tibet quickly comes to mind, but it's not the only one. So they're in a dilemma. They can't, they don't want to react so harshly that they undermine international confidence in China and they undermine the willingness to do business with China, but they can't let this thing go on. I, I, I have no idea how they're gonna solve the Hong Kong problem. They clearly haven't solved it yet. They would like to end the, the trade war with the United States, but they're in no rush to do it. I think their recent calculations is that time just shifted to their side, that they might be able to outlast President Trump. So he may, be, he may be playing a weaker hand now than he was before. Are we in a period of great power competition where war between China and the United States is inevitable? We are the dominant hegemon. They are the rising power. Historically, what happens is the rising power challenges the hegemon. There is no, yes, that's a tension, but there's, that's not a prediction. That is not inevitable. There are many, many things that can be done again the United Nations, international agencies can have a great deal to do with this so that China's rise can be accommodated in a, a still a US-led global order, but we're gonna have to share. If you ask me what the world's gonna look like in 2050, 2060, China will be a much bigger part of that global order than they are now. Students, yes sir, got it. Are san the question is, are sanctions an act of war? Sanctions work, sanctions are a tool, but sanctions have never worked by themselves. No country has ever collapsed or complied solely because of sanctions. They're only a tool to get to the place you have to get to, which is the negotiating table. Can they be an act of war? That is how Iran sees it right now. Iran thinks the United States is, is engaged in economic warfare against it, trying to cripple its economy, trying to impose its will on our European allies. Remember, when we sanction Iran, we don't actually sanction Iran. We don't do any business with Iran. The rest of the world does business with Iran. We're sanctioning Japan and India and Europe for doing business. We're saying you can't do that, even though the deal that they're still part of, the deal that still exists, says that Europe will do this. Russia will do this. China will do this. We're the ones breaking the deal and saying, no, you won't, which is why there's so much resentment in the world towards this unilateral imposition of, of US policy on our, on our allies and adversaries. So can they be seen as an act of war? You betcha. And it's in the eye of the beholder, and a lot of the beholders are seeing it that way right now. Let me give shorter answers, right? Sir, uh, the Russian, you mean the, the nuclear-powered cruise missile? Yes. One of the great pleasures of my life is to count Rachel Maddow as a friend. I knew her when she was a, uh, a commentator for, for Radio America, Air America. And I appear on her show with some regularity, and I was on last month to talk about this bizarre accident. Um, I could talk for a long time about this. Let me put it very quickly. The question was, can I talk about the, rush, the accident with the nuclear-powered cruise missile that happened in Russia? And the answer is, this is a bizarre weapon that the U.S. played around with in the 1950s and 60s. The idea is you take a cruise missile, something that can fly below radar and fly quietly to its target unseen until it hits, and you could put a nuclear engine on it, a nuclear reactor that would heat up the air and put it through the ramjet and give it a source of fuel that could make that cruise missile able to go long distances, cross oceans, which is what the Russians want, or stay in, in flight for weeks or even months, which is what the US wanted in the 1950s when we did it. There's one problem with that though. When you put a nuclear reactor in the back of that missile, there's no shielding, too heavy, got to get rid of it. And this thing just spews radioactivity. So as it flies, it's spewing radioactivity out. And should anything happen to that cruise missile, as happened in Russia, and you've got to recover it, you have an unshielded reactor operating. And what happened was the Russians in their revisitation of this kooky idea that we gave up in 1962 
tested this thing. It flew about two minutes, crashed, and these scientists were trying to recover it, and in the process, they were exposed to deadly radiation, and you had five scientists plus two other co workers uh, killed by radiation, and many of the health care uh, supply um, responders radiated as well. Any of you who have seen Chernobyl, it was like this. Think of the cruise missile as a mini Chernobyl with the same kind of cover-up attached to what happened. Denial, denial, and di denial, uh, and, and tragic accident. I don't think this weapon can ever work, um, but this, the, the Russians seem in, intent on, on trying. Uh, with a slightly different administration, you could see somebody now proposing at this time a ban on these mini Chernobyls and try to make sure they never operate or never test it, let alone put into deployment. And we have time for a couple more questions. Yes, ma'am. Miss. Wow. As a daughter of a Filipino immigrant, the question is, how necessary are foreign military bases to U.S. national security? It's hard to imagine the United States without foreign military bases. Um, we have had something resembling an empire for quite some time now, but we don't need this many. I just had on the podcast John Tierney, uh, who's the head of the Council for Liberal World, a nine-term uh, congressman from Massachusetts. And he pointed out that we have 800 military bases in 92 countries, most of which were constructed in World War II and then in the, in the beginning of the Cold War. And many of these are just unnecessary or obsolete or unnecessary. It, 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 it costs us hundreds of billions of dollars to operate these bases. And, they could, there's, and there's a beginning to be a bipartisan cooperation for closing these. As he points out, when you try to close a domestic base, there is tremendous domestic opposition to closing a base, largely because of the jobs and income stream it provides to the states. But you don't have that when you want to close a military base, particularly some of these, these smaller ones. And you've seen Donald Trump talk about this and complain about this. So there is sentiment on both sides of the aisle for, for doing this. I think this, is, I think this is going to happen that we can exist perfectly well with hundreds of bases rather than 800 bases. And the, a, cons a consolidation is in order. It is, it, we're ready to do this. And the military, the, uh, the predicted contraction of the military budget that I think is inevitable will force rationalization. And when policymakers are trying to cut programs, they really like to cut the other guy's programs first. And in this case, the other nations programs. So I think you will see this movement build. Yes, ma'am. What is known about the Saudi, the strike on the Saudi oil fields? Um, this was a very sophisticated strike. It's, it's, in my personal opinion, it's almost certainly involved Iranian produced weapons. I would be surprised if they were launched from Iran. Um, that wouldn't, I don't think the Iranians would want to leave that kind of trail. Was it done by Iraqi? Uh, Iran-friendly militia in Iraq by the Houthis in Yemen. They're certainly capable of this. And if they had the kind of weapons, and there's been indication that the Iranians have been providing this and providing the training and providing the uh, manufacturing capability for this. I, th I personally think it's too early for the Houthis to have produced this kind of strike. This was, this was a sweet military operation. This was beautifully done and extremely effective and took out a significant portion of the Saudi oil production uh, facility with 17 drones or cruise missiles. In my view, Iran was sending a message. This was not, look what we can do. It was, look at the kind of things we can do. You want to keep pressing us? You think your sanctions are going to cause us to, to crumble, to surrender to you? You think we're the Japanese on the deck of the USS Missouri? Think again. And they were taking a, a, thermo, a, the, a, a rheostat and moving it one notch and showing you what you can do. It doesn't have to be a full-out war to cripple the economy of the West. You can shut down the Saudi oil production. And for all the money that the Saudis spend, I think it's $128 billion a year on military. They are excruciatingly vulnerable. None of that has given them the kind of protection that they absolutely need to stop an attack like this. 
and it's a harbinger of things to come. You think it's so cool to have this nuclear, this, 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 this modern warp weapons? You like cyber warfare? You like drone attacks? You think that makes it possible for a kid in Utah to take out a terrorist in Pakistan while seemingly playing a video game? How are you going to like it when we do it? So there's blowback. And this is a sign of warfare to come. And it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be predictable. And it's not going to be fair. Yes, sir. Yes, please. Where do nuclear weapons fit in the future of warfare? These were weapons developed 74 years ago. How do they relate, is the question, to cyber warfare, drone attacks, hybrid warfare, the kinds of warfare we're seeing now? My answer is very simple. They do not relate. Nuclear weapons are obsolete. In my view, they're an accident of history. We thought Hitler was developing a bomb. Einstein wrote Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and, and with the cooperation of the British, convinced the Americans to start a, an emergency program to counter Hitler's bomb. That's why we did it. None of the scientists who started that program ever thought we would use it. It was too horrible a weapon. Why would you ever use something like this that kills hundreds of thousands of innocent men, women, and children? But by the time the war had ended and we had defeated Hitler, the Japanese did not have the bomb, but we did. And, and, and mass slaughter of civilians had become routine, and we used it. The only time in history, twice, within a week, we used it. Nuclear weapons have played a role in deterrence, in convincing other countries not to start wars because of the high cost, but that has not been the only reason. The UN is as old as the nuclear weapons are, as the nuclear bomb is. The UN is as old as the nuclear bomb, and I would say the United Nations has played as least an important a role in stopping wars as the bomb has. So has our security relations, so did the Marshall Plan, so did our alliances, so did the image of the United States and the moral clarity it offered to the world. All those prevented Europe from going to war again. We, we created a structure that stopped the bloodiest continent in human history from going to war. And it worked. Did nuclear weapons play a role? Yes. Do we need to have 2,000 hydrogen bombs in our arsenal? Does Russia need to have 2,000 hydrogen bombs? No way. No way. You could, if you believe in deterrence, and I frankly do not, I think it is immoral to threaten the mass destruction of innocent, innocent civilians who had nothing to do with their country's decision. I think that is immoral. I don't think you should have nuclear weapons. I think they should be abolished. But you don't have to agree with me. You may think we need 100 or 200, I'll give you 500 nuclear weapons. We have 6,000 in our stockpile. There's a lot of compromise that we can do to get to a more rational nuclear system, and then we can see if we can get down to the complete elimination. And I believe this reality is becoming more and more apparent to more and more people who see the kind of warfare that really matters, that really can hurt you. When you can do what a stroke of, well, a, stroke of a, com a computer keyboard, the kind of damage that we once thought you needed a nuclear weapon for, why do you still need the nuclear weapon? Why do you still need the nuclear weapon? I think we're moving in that direction, but we've stalled right now. We're at this inflection point. And the reason we stalled is that most of the world's nuclear weapons arsenals, the United States and Russia, are, are aging out. And both countries are making decisions to build another generation. We've only done this three times. Ronald Reagan was the la and, and, and Leonard Brezhnev were the last ones who did this. That was in the 70s and 80s. Well, those weapons are now wearing out and we're time for new. The problem is that's going to cost us about $2 trillion. And that's just the estimated cost right now. Weapons always increase. Do you want to spend that? Is that way you want to spend $2 trillion to replicate the existing arsenal? I think we have better uses for our defense dollars than in investing them in obsolete weapons from the 20th century. Um, I, I am confident that that kind of logic will prevail, whether it's a Republican or Democratic president in the next election. And I'll be happy to come back next year and defend that prediction, <laughs> if you'll have me. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. <laughs>